So it feels important to begin by telling you all something which I didn't discover myself, but I was just told by Reverend Mark about this space that we're in now. This um, room was the setting of the funeral of Emily Wilding. And if you don't know who Emily Wilding is by name, you will when I tell you that she was the suffragette who threw herself in front of the horses at the horse races. And she had her funeral here. And this was the fifth church that they tried because she was such a hate figure that, that, that they wouldn't bury her anywhere else. So we're in a, a place with, with some history of, um, of, of receptiveness to the radical. And uh, it's important to notice, certainly for me, speaking to myself, it's important to notice how somebody like Emily was a hate figure in her own time and is now a heroine. And that tells us something about how unpopular we might need to be for a while, maybe for 100 years, before people recognize that we were doing the right thing. Some couple of years ago, there was a documentary, a really good documentary, actually, about Thatcher, who um, recorded something in her diary. And I have forever after been trying to track down who it was who said this. Um, she was quoting somebody, that we shouldn't be afraid of being hated. Because if nobody hates us, the chances are we haven't really done anything. We've never taken a side in something that mattered. Uh, and that's a thought that's been prominent in my mind as I've thought in the last days about, about civil resistance. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of being, of being hated. When I wrote the first draft of uh, what I was gonna say to you this evening, it was mainly about my own uh, evolving relationship with civil resistance. Um, and I decided to cut all that out, but now you're all sitting in front of me, I'm wondering whether I should have. So I'll give you a very abbreviated version before I go on to um, addressing what I was asked to speak about, which is the ethical basis of civil resistance. I'm not um, the sort who likes going on protest marches, and I'm not the sort who would enjoy being tied to a goalpost in a Newcastle game. Um, and I think that there are three reasons, some of which are interesting and some of which aren't. One of, one of them is just temperamental, that I'm quite irenic by nature, and I think that I got into philosophy and theology because I like consensus. And the deepest disagreements between people tend to be at that level, at the level of what they most deeply believe. And so it always struck me this was the most important place to build consensus. And that kind of temperamentally is where I am. And so participating in public conflict or public disorder is an uncomfortable thing for me. And so I haven't been involved with civil resistance. Um, I haven't had a kind of liking for it on that level. But that's kind of trivial, that's just temperamental. There's a, a different reason, which I want to mention at the outset because everything I'm about to say relativizes that. I'm not anti-establishment um, by sentiment. And I think that, particularly as a woman, uh, the existence of social order and law is very important for us living free um, and peaceful and healthy lives. So I'm not anti-order by nature, and I think that there's a tendency in societies where we have a law that works, and we have law enforcement that works, that we tend to underestimate just how powerful that is and just what an amazing gift that is. And we only need to remember that when we look at countries, we, we only need to look at countries where they don't have that to notice how important that is. And so resistance to that framework or an attempt to push back against that framework strikes me as something that we need a very good reason to do. Um, which is a good way of introducing what I'm going to say about the ethical basis of civil resistance because there is a very good reason to do it, to put it mildly. Now, um, I was a bit devastated that the last IPCC report came out right after Putin had invaded Ukraine. That was unfortunate timing. Because um, the previous IPCC report, Gutierrez, the um, UN Secretary General said that it was a code red for humanity. About this report, he said this. Probably all of you in the room know this anyway. Uh, that it's an atlas of human suffering and an indictment of failed leadership. He said, delay means death. 
And, so, and he's not a radical, you know. This isn't a person who enjoys just being a thorn in the flesh of the way things work. This is the UN Secretary General saying that delay means death. It's almost impossible for me to imagine a more urgent moment for civil resistance or a greater legitimacy for civil resistance. And again, I, I know I'm probably preaching to the converted, but it seems important to say that because I've traveled a long way about this. I, I started hearing about climate change when I was 12. I remember it incredibly clearly. I was in a geography classroom and the teacher drew a earth on the board and around the earth he drew a greenhouse and then he put little drops of sweat on the uh, face of the earth. And I was terrified. I thought, How, I've got to get out of the greenhouse quick or someone has to take the greenhouse away. Complete panic straight away. And then I thought in that way that 12 year olds do, do well, don't worry, there are grown ups running the world and they'll know what to do. They'll, they'll do something about it. And by the time I grow up, this will, this will all be over. So it was quite a moment to notice that at COP26, the grown ups who run the world yet again didn't do what was necessary. And we're currently heading for 2.7 degrees of warming, which is, as I don't mean to tell you, too many. Shortly before um, COP26, I was at the, uh, a gathering of the world's faith leaders at the Vatican. They were signing a joint appeal to go to the summit. Um, and we were very lucky to have Ho Sung Lee with us in the meeting. Ho Sung Lee is the chair of the IPCC, uh, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and he said that the question that keeps him up at night is not what's happening. We know what's happening. It's not what are we going to do about it because we know what we need to do about it. The question that keeps him up at night is, why aren't we doing what we know we should do? We've known what we should do for a long time. And he's, you've probably all seen him in videos, he's an extremely calm man. There's no drama about him, there's no performance about him. He just said it flat like that. Why don't we do it? It's a terrible mystery. Uh, he really put words into my mouth because as someone who's spoken about these issues for a long time, I've lain awake at night wearing the same thing, wondering the same thing. Why do we not do what we know we should do? And why do I keep on saying the same thing? And nothing ever seems to change. And at some point I got sick of myself saying those things and then noticing that nothing changed. And I stopped. I stopped taking up invitations to speak about it. Because I felt like whatever I was doing wasn't working. What everybody else was doing wasn't working. So why should I go on? It felt like um, someone giving you a Rubik's cube that is designed to not have a solution. And of course, at some point, you're just going to put the cube down and be like, well, I give up. And that was how it felt, not understanding why all of this knowledge that we had wasn't adding up to change. I think that civil resistance is based on a response to that situation. It's the natural response to noticing that the things that we've been doing haven't been working, and so we need to just step in and actually force something. It's a way of enacting a, a, a refusal to accept the status quo. Here I want to make a very important distinction. Civil resistance is, of course, not the same as armed revolution. It has a different structure. Armed revolution is based on the idea that you need to actually make the change. Civil resistance in this context is more like communicating symbolically that a change needs to be made. It would be possible to mount armed revolution in this situation, but it wouldn't be the effective way, even if we thought it was the right thing to do, which I don't. It wouldn't be the effective way in the same way that asking somebody to um, change their attitude by changing their clothes doesn't work. What we actually need now is a, a root and branch reformation of the entire way that our civilization works. Civil resistance is a communication about that, it's a communicative action. In that sense, I think it's a far deeper, truer, and more authentic response than armed revolution ever could be. We can talk about that more at the end. I'm not going to talk too much more about that, but there's so many examples we can look at of people who made the same decision in similar circumstances. So 
So going back to my exhaustion and my fed upness, which I'm sure we all feel. Why am I trying again? I seem to be here trying again. <clears throat> Not, by the way, that uh, I'm really trying again with you, right? But you're all people who are try trying again in your settings. Well, the first thing that I did, and that I'm going to suggest that we all do and that we do together now, is stop and think. Stop and think because what's been happening is very strange. Imagine it like this. There's uh, a crowd, and they're all walking together, quite happily chatting to each other. At some point, someone in the crowd notices that there's a cliff ahead. And one of them says, hey, hey guys, there's a cliff. Shall we stop? And then people are like, no, 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 there's no cliff. There's no cliff. And then some, people, some more people see the cliff, and they say, no, come on, there really is. We should really stop. And finally, everybody is like, yeah, probably should stop, shouldn't we? But they can't seem to. They just keep going. And then they start to panic because they notice they're still walking towards the cliff, even though they all want to live. And then they just start saying goodbye to each other. It's very strange. It's not a story that's possible to tell. You'd never find that story in a book because it doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's exactly what's been happening. We've all agreed that we want to live. We all know what stopping walking looks like in this situation, and we haven't done it. That's a puzzle. That deserves some thinking about. What happens next in the story, we don't know, because that's the story that we're in the middle of. But what I can tell you is that all we need to do to find out is to wait, because the cliff will carry on coming closer, whatever we do. The, um, the, ch the chair, uh, president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in the Vatican said that his um, one-year-old granddaughter was growing up to live in a world that is probably going to be uninhabitable. When I was a child, I used to worry about the sun exploding in four billion years. I used to actually worry about that at night. <laughs> oh my gosh, one day the sun, the, sun, the sun will explode, and then what will we do? And then mum would be like, don't worry, you won't be around. But we're not talking about four million years, any four billion years, we're talking about, or four, four million, we're talking about one generation. And this is the puzzle, right? Is that the story is not actually as I've, sold it, as I've told it to you. It's not only that the crowd sees the cliff coming and then they all agree they need to stop and then they don't. It's even weirder. Once they see the cliff, they actually start running. Because. Also, as I don't need to tell you, everything we now know about fossil fuels leading to global warming, we knew in 1979. Which means, for those of you who've read Timothy um, Wells, totally forgotten his name, Timothy Wells' book, uh, The Uninhabitable Earth, what that means is we've done more damage to the earth in the time since we've known what we were doing than we did in the whole rest of human history put together. So it's not only that knowing about the cliff didn't stop us from walking. We've actually, the, the period of our knowledge has coincided with the period of our greatest destructive effect, which is even more baffling. It's not at all shocking, by the way, that we accidentally started destroying the earth with fossil fuels. I don't think that's at all shocking. We didn't know what we were doing. What requires explanation is that once we did know what we were doing, we didn't stop. That's the puzzle. I think that this has been almost completely overlooked. That particular puzzle, that's a question that deserves answering. Our knowledge has not corresponded to changed patterns. So, the conversation about climate change has a nauseating repetitious, right? repetitiousness uh, in which we just go on repeating the numbers and repeating all these scary things that are going to happen and, and presenting the data and so on. Um, but as that example I just mentioned indicates, science alone, information alone, uh, is not what we need 
it hasn't worked. That's one conclusion we can draw immediately from what I just described to you. Science alone is not enough. It's exactly the same as telling somebody that smoking will kill them won't stop them smoking, or telling them that eating junk food will make their chances of getting bowel cancer rise by X percent doesn't stop them eating junk food. People are very fond of quoting Einstein's um, saying that madness is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And I used to say that all the time, but I don't actually think that's true anymore. I think that's too easy. It's get letting ourselves off lightly if we say that the problem is that we're mad, because madness is not a choice. I think the problem is actually much deeper than that. It's actually the narrowness of our thinking. It's our thinking only in one register about how human beings work. Our, our contemporary obsession with scientific uh, knowledge, with empirical measurement. That obsession leads us to mistake uh, facts for the truth. Facts and truth are not the same. It leads us to mistake uh, information for understanding. Information is just zeros and ones. Information doesn't add up to understanding, and facts can function untruthfully. We all know that. So the, the missing link in our response to climate change, the puzzle that I was mentioning to you a second ago about why we've behaved like this, is that information is not what we've been missing and it's not what we need. If it is knowledge that we need, it's not knowledge about the universe, it's knowledge about human beings. It's knowledge about ourselves. That's what we don't have. It's interesting that we say that we live in an age of the Anthropocene, but don't really stop to notice that what that means is that in order to understand our age, what we need to understand is the Anthropos, the human. So lesson number one about the Anthropos, just from what I've told you. Facts by themselves do not have any motivational power, by themselves. Nobody ever really gave their life for just a fact. Facts become motivational, they gain motivational power when they connect to something that is actually important to us. So what determines our actions is not actually, contra the entire kind of prevailing assumption, what determines our actions is not actually what's true, it's what's important. Literally, what carries weight for us, that's what the word important means, right? Excuse me for sitting down, but I had, um, I had hip surgery recently and I'm not the best with standing. <clears throat> What causes us to act on facts is values that tell us which facts are important and why. For example, famous example from philosophy. The mere fact that you are in pain does not by itself make me act to help you. David Hume was completely right when he pointed this out. The fact that you're in pain needs to relate to a sense I have of what's important first. For example, that there's an imperative to help people who are in need. In the same way, the mere fact that more than three billion, billion lives will become unlivable with 2.7 degrees of global warming may have no importance to me. It may just not import for me. It may not have connect to any value that I have. My partner Manuel, who's sitting over there, is in touch with somebody who's in Ethiopia at the moment an Ethiopian who messages him occasionally. And the messages say things like, uh, and we, we were reading some messages from him today, so this is completely live. And the messages say things like, we are hungry, we have no food. My family has no food. My family is hungry. We are in a very bad situation, please help. The fact that he's hungry is just a fact until I have a reason to care about it, until I have some values that tell me that's important. It's important that he's hungry. We really need to zoom out from the facts. We need to zoom out from uh, climate, the climate problem, from the biodiversity problem, from geopolitics, not because those things don't matter, but because they matter so much. We can't afford to look at them in a narrow perspective. 
the environmental movement quite understandably, and I'm addressing myself, by the way, as well, has been captivated by science. Captivated by what we call the science, in fact. But the science really doesn't mean anything unless and until we connect it to what's really important to us. So civil, resistant, civil resistance movements, yes, we need to communicate the facts, but the center of the community, communicative action that a civil resistance movement is, needs to be values. That's what will cause people to engage with the facts. That's what will make them even notice them. Otherwise, we're just delivering information. We've spent so much civilizational energy trying to understand climate science and ecosystems. And we've spent so little civilizational energy trying to understand ourselves. I'm sure some of you are thinking what I thought to myself when I imagined myself saying this to you or indeed to anyone else, which is, we really don't have time for this. We don't have time for all this philosophy, theology, religious mumbo jumbo stuff. It's true that we have no time to waste, three years probably, if we're lucky. It's true that we have to act with complete decisiveness, but it's an illusion to think that reflecting deeply and acting are in some kind of tension. Or even that they're opposites, which is often how our society talks about it, right? There's thinking and there's doing, but it's not like that. A member of a bomb disposal, disposal squad has to become more calm the less time there is. Has to draw more deeply on her understanding of how bombs work the less time there is. She mustn't react to the situation, she must respond to the situation. In the case of the bomb disposal expert, the object of her understanding is explosives. She has to be very calm to understand that and to act appropriately. In our case, the object of understanding is human beings. We need to be very calm and very clear and draw deeply on understanding because there is so little time. So I'm not at all saying that we should slow down. Far from it or take time out, or something like that. Uh, what I'm saying is that we should focus on what is really at issue, so that we know what to do with the time that we have. Every civilization in history, until ours, gave the attention and energy of their greatest minds to this question. What is a human being? What makes a human being tick? What motivates a human being? what draws a human being, what moves a human being. Until ours, we're the first society that doesn't really have any time for that question. We've systematically sidelined the disciplines in which that question is asked, and we've systematically sidelined the communities in which that question is asked. But without engaging that frame, that frame of, of, of the meaning and direction of human life, we don't know why we should do anything. Everything just becomes random and directionless and subjectivized and privatized and atomized and individualized. And then our action inevitably becomes myopic and fragmented and ultimately despairing, which happened to me, by the way. As I just described to you, I just gave up. That ultimate framing of human life um, which orients and motivates action, which makes sense of what we do, which tells us what to do and what not to do, what's worthwhile and what's not worthwhile, what's worth acting for and what's not worth acting for, that ultimate frame is what we refer to in our language and time, uh, usually as faith. We might also call it the spiritual or we might call it the moral. We have various different ways of, of referring to that. I have all of those in view when I, when I speak to you now and I'm not necessarily wanting to recommend any one way of talking about that, right? But the key point is people need to believe in something in order to act. They need to have some values in order to act. To quote uh, Proverbs, 
without vision, the people perish. Civil resistance needs vision. Without vision, there's no why, no direction, no purpose, no sense of the point of it all. So this may seem a very long way away from fossil fuels. Um, but I hope you can see that it's anything but. The world did not act even when it saw the empirical reality of what it was doing. And that's because facts are not enough. A material logic is not enough. Numbers and data and measurements and forecasts and parts per million of carbon dioxide is not enough. Even the numbers of the people who are going to be displaced and drowned and burned and suffocated and starved and all of that is not enough. They're just numbers. They're just numbers unless we have a reason to care. And quite clearly, they are just numbers, by the way, because we've known those numbers about what's going to happen to people for a long time, and on we go. Environmental advocacy in general urgently needs to break out of that narrow register of the empirical and the numerical and the scientific to overcome that social obsession that we have with information and to put forward a vision that could actually motivate and inspire. Loads of people in environmentalist circles um, and indeed beyond them are very suspicious of this kind of language. Sometimes it's for the reason that I just mentioned, right, that, that, that there's a worry that we don't have enough time. And I've tried to explain why I think that's not uh, a sensible refusal of this perspective. Others just have an allergy to anything that, that, that seems to be a reference to a beyond, right? They want to just stick with this world and with the material and the given and <coughs> maybe they call that atheism or, or, or maybe they call it materialism or just secularism. Some of you might have heard of Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson uh, founded the, what's called the Equal Justice Initiative in the USA. You might have come across his book, Just Mercy. Very amazing guy. Um, I heard him lecture a few years ago. He was explaining what it's like to live in a society which is still endemically racist 60 years after segregation. A society which leads young black men into lives of criminality in a massively disproportionate way. Criminality they've usually ended up in by desperation and which often incarcerates them regardless and often incarcerates them even if they're innocent. He accompanies young black men on uh, death row. I say young black men, they are, are nearly all men, as it happens. Um, and in his talk, he didn't, he, he didn't mention the word faith. He didn't, even men he didn't mention the word God. There was nothing kind of obviously, quote, transcendent about what he was saying. But somebody in the audience uh, knew that he was a Christian and asked him what that had to do with his work. And it wasn't a friendly question, by the way, it was a hostile question. Why do you need faith for all this stuff? And there was an incredibly long and very painful pause. And then he said, and I've never heard anybody put it like this, and I've also never heard it quoted, which amazes me, because it was absolutely seared into my mind. He said, if you do not believe in a world you cannot see, you will never change this one. Faith, the word faith, in this sense, just signifies something very simple and uncontroversial. It's exactly what he just said, what Brian Stevenson just said. Recognizing our ultimate values always takes place against the horizon beyond what we can see and touch. There's no way around that. We may not ever choose to call it theism or religion or faith or we may never choose to call it anything at all. That's not really the issue. It's something like what Hegel meant when he said, the human being is spirit. He didn't mean the human beings aren't also material. He meant human beings live against a transcendent horizon. It's what Martin Luther King meant when he said that he had a dream, that he'd seen the promised land. The promised land is nowhere to be seen, look around you. But it's because he'd seen it that he was able to have that dream and therefore act. It's what 
Gandhi communicated, I think, when he, a little known fact, when he died with the words Hey Ram on his lips. Hey Ram means, oh God. So I've said civil resistance movements need vision. Civil resistance movements also need faith. In that, exactly that sense. There's something else that civil resistance movements need to learn connected to these two issues. If we're motivated by values and not by facts, then the other thing that faith communities know uh, about human beings and can teach us is that love is more motivating than truth. Human beings are creatures of love before they're creatures of truth. Faith communities are specialists in knowing how to elicit that love. Pope Paul VI said that, um, uh, that, that the church was, quote, an expert in humanity. I think that's true of faith communities in general. They're experts in humanity. And that's what their expertise is, drawing forth the love that actually motivates human beings. They know that it's love that draws forth the profoundest commitment, the deepest energy, the deepest willingness to sacrifice the capacity to give yourself to something. They don't make the mistake that our society makes of thinking that what's most important can be quantified. Love can't be quantified. Faith can't be quantified. Vision can't be quantified. The basis of civil resistance in our time is not the truths that people don't want to hear. If they don't want to hear them, they won't. It's love. Love that connects with those truths. Love that says that those facts about what will happen to the three billion people who will be displaced within a few decades. Love that says that those people actually matter. In the um, Hebrew Bible, God's love for, for, for Israel is expressed in his faithfulness to them. One of the most often repeated expressions in the Hebrew Bible, right? Uh, that God is faithful. And I used to find that a bit strange and a bit upsetting. I was like, can't he just say that he loves us? It's as simple as that, isn't it? And then I understood that faithfulness is what we call love when it's carried through time. Faithfulness is just love carried through. It's relationship followed up on. Love is loyalty. Psychology and sociology and anthropology have told us uh, what the Hebrew scriptures already knew thousands of years ago, which is that it's loyalty that really motivates. It's a sense of belonging that really motivates. It's other people that really motivate. It's our connection with those around us that really motivates. It's our relationships that really motivate. This is something that faith communities really understand. And again, by faith communities, I'm not talking only about in a narrow religious sense, but communities where this wider understanding of value is alive. We consistently misdiagnose ourselves as, as independent and we consistently address people as though they were independent and they aren't. They aren't atomized monads who make decisions in isolation. For example, we know that the biggest predictor of what you will think about climate change is not whether you have access to the right information, it's what the people around you believe. In just the same way as the biggest indicator of whether you feel wealthy is not how much money you have, it's how much money the people around you have. In just the same way that in all kinds of communities, and for example, North America, people don't have a problem with fossil fuel divestment because they don't think climate change is real. It's because they're part of communities where that's seen as a betrayal. This identity thing is what modern societies understand in what we call identity politics. We actually depend on and are motivated by the recognition of others and the relationship we have with others and the way those relationships shape our sense of identity in our life is utterly fundamental. And once again, the information mindset and the science mindset doesn't take that into account. It doesn't take into account the way that our values are shaped by the community that we're part of and by the people around us and by our loyalty to them. 
So saying that love is the basis of civil resistance, one of the things that we're saying is that we need to take into account that human beings are primarily social. We're primarily, uh, we primarily exist in relationship. And it's our commitment to those relationships that is the deepest and most motivating force. John Paul II put it in the strongest way. He said, there is no such thing as a person alone. Personhood literally is being in relation. There is no solitude that's even possible to st and still be a person. I think environmentalism in particular and civil resistance in general urgently needs to learn this anthropology and notice that we're still talking about understanding the human. We're still talking about noticing what it is that actually makes a human being work. What draws the deepest energies of change and commitment and self-giving from a human being. So a final, a final uh, reflection. I've suggested to you at least three necessary bases of civil resistance. Vision, faith, and love. Many of you will know the saying of Augustine, <clears throat> tell me what you love and I will tell you who you are. And Augustine didn't say that only as a consolation. It was also a warning because it's possible to love the wrong thing. And Augustine's most famous work, The City of God, is about how what you love divides you into the two halves of humanity, the ones who are going the right way and the ones who are going the wrong way. And you can go back much further than Augustine, of course, the book of Deuteronomy, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. Love by itself is not, the, is not adequate content. The question is, what should we love? We need, you know, hours, days, weeks, and months to talk about that. So I'm gonna restrict myself to one um, incredibly brief partial comment about this. <clears throat> I used to think that the thing that people needed to love more and better was nature. Because nature is the thing that we're destroying. And I went around constantly enjoining people to love nature more and to spend more time with nature, to connect with plants and animals and, and to, to learn about nature and um, to develop a kind of contemplative attitude where we're capable of seeing the beauty and therefore caring about it. And there are so many sources of that sentiment, right? Pope Francis's most recent environmental teaching is one of them, he himself presents that um, and, and enjoins it. I still think it's important to love nature, but I've started to think that lack of love for nature is really not what's been missing. I could say loads about this, but I'll, I'll be very brief. The particular feelings of reverence and awe that we have for nature, I think are very distinctive of European romanticism, which is basically, uh, in my own reading, the spiritual taproot of modern Western environmentalism. But it's a very curious fact that in the time of romanticism, we've done more damage to nature than we've ever done before. I'm not sure that sentimentality about nature is very helpful. This is an age in which, in this country, animal charities receive more money than human ones. We don't lack a love for animals. Disney reigns in millions of hearts, including mine, by the way. There's a very lively love of nature out there. That's one reason that I don't think that's the missing link. That's not the missing value. There's another reason. This is actually a deeper reason. Nature's gonna be fine. Nature is, we really don't need to worry about nature. Yes, some species are gonna go extinct. Yes, the planet's gonna change. But nature has sent many species extinct before. And it, it will still be here. The planet will still be here. 
when we've destroyed ourselves. Nature has a resilience that is infinitely beyond anything that humanity can dream of. Nature, I think, is not what's really at risk. The nature that we know and the nature that we love is at risk, but nature itself, not at risk. The thing that's at risk is us. It's not a lack of love for nature that will kill us. It's a lack of love for ourselves that will kill us. Lots of environmentalist rhetoric, particularly in Christian circles, eco-theological circles, says that love for humanity is the problem, that we love ourselves too much, that human arrogance is the root of the whole thing. Well, no doubt arrogance is a problem, but it's worth considering that a brief exposure to the world of modern psychology tells you that arrogance is usually a mask for a lack of self-worth. Healthy spiritualities teach that self-respect underpins humility and doesn't contradict it. Really to esteem ourselves means thinking that we're worth saving. I don't think anything else is adequate motivation. So that's the answer to what we should love. We should love humanity. The vision that we need is the vision of a truly human future, a future in which human life is actually possible. That's what's at risk. That's the future that we're currently moving very quickly towards, a future in which life will be much less human and much less possible for more humans. If we don't cultivate a love for humanity, we won't deem ourselves worth saving. Thank you. I'm feeling um, humbled by what Kamodi has said. Um, and when I came to London five years ago, I felt like one of those you know, classical anthropologists that have come into a weird and wonderful, perverse sort of society where people believe ridiculous things. <laughs> and, and it was quite esoteric. Uh, and, and I haven't really recovered because I don't think at all like most people think in this society, which is one of the reasons I'm standing here, I suppose. Um, And so I'll just, I'll just mention one or two things. I don't really want to regurgitate what Kamodi said, so I'll, be, I'll just inadequately run through one or two things. First of all, it's always appeared to me that information is useless. <laughs> information is useless. It's not, that's not what motivates people. Um, it's also always seemed obvious to me that if, if we don't love each other in a very practical way, we're totally fucked. <laughs> Which is why I, I'm totally opposed to violence. I'm totally opposed to othering our opponents. Because once we've done that, there's no, there's no hope. Because I don't think for a moment that we're any better than our opponents. At all. Um, we're all part of a a community of humanity. And I think this idea that if we don't love humanity, we're, we're never going to get anywhere is totally true. I can't really prove it, but I deeply believe it. And I, and I think loving humanity is a total act of faith. It's an act of will. Because there's, I think if we're honest with ourselves, there's ample reason to hate humanity and ourselves. And there's a literature which supports the idea that we want to kill ourselves because we hate ourselves. And it's not really talked about, is it? <laughs> but it feels very aware, something that's very aware, I'm very aware of. And also, it's an act of faith for me to believe in the good, and it's an act of faith for me to believe 
in following God. And I have a sense of what that, belief, what that means. And it's not, I want to emphasize, it's not something that I've come to through ignoring my rational inquiry, but exactly the opposite. That it's through thousands of hours of thinking that I've, has brought me to the idea that without faith, we're lost. In other words, you just have to accept some things. You have to accept that the only way to live your life is to pursue the good, and it has to be a dogma. And as some of you know, I've I spent a lot of time doing mobilizing because I feel that's where I can be or most of service. But my fantasy is to walk into a motorway by myself with my hand up and just go like that, you know. I'd be in ecstasy doing it. I couldn't wait to get into a motorway on my own and stand in front of that evil in a feel, with a feeling of ecstasy because for me that is the essence of pursuing the good at a time of evil. And that in itself, the reason I'm ecstatic about that idea is because the only thing that makes sense in my life is to, is to pursue the good. That's it. Which brings me to the, the tragedy, I think, of the climate movement that we're all conning ourselves that the most costly option is to act and the safe option is to not act. And I have to go along with that nonsense all the time. <laughs> but I don't believe it in a minute. I think it's the greatest privilege to act for the good. And it, I don't have any doubt that if, if we can have this revolution, as it were, in how we see life, then the empire will fall. It will fall. And this is why I'm so intensely excited about what Komodi is saying. Um, I haven't got it all worked out, but there's something in there, maybe you sense it as well, there's something in there which is going to give us the enormous power that we undoubtedly need to be utterly fearless in the face of state repression. And I just want to finish with this point about action because I think many of us, including myself, have this sort of suspicion that we're going to go down some rabbit hole of spiritualist quietism, you know. <laughs> we're just going to have to say, oh, we need a weekend on this, and we're all going to try and work it all out, and then that will lead to another weekend, and before we know it, we won't be able to do any actions because we're still thinking about our deepest values. That's utterly not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say and what I invite everyone to do, and, and obviously many of us are doing this, is, is we'll find salvation in action, not by avoiding it. And we find God and we find faith and we find the good, whatever words we want to use, in the moment of confrontation with the savagery that we know is happening. And when we take that perspective, we see action as something that enlivens us and empowers us. And it's a glorious thing. It's the thing that makes life living. It's to go out there in the motorway and stick your hand up and say, no. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what I mean? It's like, I can't wait. I can't wait. You know, but unfortunately, I've got an office job now, so. <laughs> anyway, I just want to finish with um, one of my sort of secret heroes, which is Simone Vail. And interesting enough, I did mention this to Komodi, and she knows this woman, uh, unsurprisingly. But I, I read her in, in, in my 20s, and she blew my mind, and then I re rediscovered her at Christmas. And, I was in Germany, I went and did this little lecture in Prague and I thought they were all going to 
be deep, meaningful, existentialist, but I don't think they quite got it. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm going to finish with this quote. So Simone Weil, in case you don't know, was a mystic and revolutionary in the 1920s and 30s. She died at the age of 34, semi-starving herself to death because she refused to have more food than the French when she was in exile in, in the UK. Anyway, I think this quote really sums up the absolute power and transgression of the viewpoint that we need to engage in to destroy the empire. And it goes something along the following lines. It says, she says, um, when you have a difficult decision to make, choose the option that will cost you the most. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. So, um, I have a habit of which greatly annoys my students of responding to most questions by saying that's the right question. Uh, I think that absolutely is the right question. We've hugely underestimated the power of storytelling. I think that it's kind of it's taking off now. I had I had a um, a sort of round robin from a bank recently, which had a a sort of um, you know, fun articles for customers. And one of them was about the importance of storytelling in understanding markets and economics. The, the kind of, the, the interest in narrative has, has become, has really popularized. So I think we now seem to know more widely that storytelling is fundamental to human motivation and it's fundamental to shaping community and that what really brings communities together is that they share a story. A story which is often partially about them and about what that community is, but usually also refers to something beyond the community, right? And this is true of um, religious communities, but also of ethnic ones uh, and cultural and regional ones. And far-right movements absolutely tap into that. They know exactly how to tell a story that creates an exclusive sense of identity. So I guess instead of answering your question directly, I might just put a question back, which is, we know that we need to tell stories. We know about the power of stories. The question is, what's the right story? Or indeed, what are the right stories? Plato, who wasn't a soft-minded chap, said that philosophy is telling the right stories in the right way. And a way of looking at what Augustine meant when he said, tell me what you love and I'll tell you who you are, would be, tell me what your story is and I'll tell you who you are. You know, what's your beginning and your end? And we need to get the story right. And at the moment, uh, sorry, I'm not gonna go on, um, but just thinking aloud about this. At the moment, we have a story about what human beings are that is deeply unmotivating. And if I had a criticism of the environmental kind of advocacy movement at the very, very broadest level, I would say that it's had a very negative story of human beings of what a human being is and what the place of human beings is in the world more widely. And that story hasn't helped. So I think, yes, we need to ask what the right stories are. And I don't exactly know the answer to that. When Roger suggested that I speak on this, um, under this title, that was the question that I thought I should answer. And I wrote that talk, and then I scratched it. Because I thought that the answer to that question depends on those more fundamental issues about what's ultimately important. And that if we don't have in view what is ultimately important, then the, uh, the question of what counts as guilt, for example, or what the right thing is to do, or who we should be in the society that we're in, are impossible to answer. 
So I'm really glad that you asked that question. I asked it to myself. And that was just an apologia for why I said what I said. We need a fundamental grounding in what's fundamentally important to be able to answer any of those things that come along down the line. And I have the extremely deepest uh, respect and humility before anybody who is about to go to court, which I know will probably include others in this room. Um, I hope this isn't, this isn't a kind of cheap or simple answer. It's extremely apparent that while on the one hand, law and the um, institutions which express and enforce it are necessary for our life, and I do believe that, and I'm not an anarchist. And while social order is a condition of our flourishing, and we know that from seeing societies with no social order, with no law and with no law enforcement, while they are goods, they aren't absolute goods, and they express or represent certain values. And when those values are wrong, it becomes obligatory to resist the laws and their enforcement. And a large part of what I would think of as ethics is about knowing how to discern when that is the case. And I think there are loads of gray areas. And that it's not simple. It requires that we stop and think. However, there are also many instances in uh, recent history that we can all think of, and many, many more instances that, for whatever reason, are less well known, when, as we look back, we can see that it is absolutely clear <clears throat> that to cooperate with a given uh, form of social order and a given form of political order and a given form of legal order was an absolute betrayal of humanity itself. And that when that becomes the case, we break the law in order not to be guilty. Yeah, that might be all I can say. I mean, these are just such important questions. And I need to be very upfront about the fact that I've spent all my life thinking about ultimate value. And only at this stage and under the pressure of circumstance am I trying to figure out what it looks like when that ultimate value meets the world that we happen to live in which is what your question was about and what that question is about. And I'm, th these questions deeply trouble me and I don't have any easy answers. My, my own thinking is guided almost entirely with reference to those who have faced these situations before and who the judgment of history sees as having, in some way, represented real humanity in inhuman times. Even though, in their time, what they did was compromised, and in some sense, they did make themselves guilty. So I'm, um, I'm a learner, and you're seeing me in the middle of, of of a process of reflection, but let me just share with you something as I think about this and as I think about what you just asked about the, the nature of guilt and the nature of lawbreaking. Somebody who's extremely important to me and has become more important to me is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, um, who I'm sure you all already know about, 
was one of the Germans who noticed that the social and political order of his time was, um, was representing an objective evil and that to cooperate with it was to cooperate with evil. He noticed at some point that he would have to become guilty by the standards of that order in order to represent real humanity, and he did. And that although in one limited sense that represented real guilt, in another sense it was the only form of innocence available. Non-compliance. Which is to speak to what you just asked. <clears throat> but he also went a step further, which is to speak to what you just said, by noticing that it wasn't enough to just refuse to comply. He had to take, in his view, an action which made him, in some sense, even more guilty, because it was not just passively suffering by refusing to comply, it was actively, uh, actively obstructing and, in some sense, directly causing uh, suffering by participating in the plot to kill Hitler. And he recognised that in some way that did really make him guilty. He was really causing harm. And he felt that in some sense that guilt was the only thing left to him. It was the only way of acting righteously in the situation, was to somehow notice that the situation was messy. It was what it was. There was no point wishing it was different. The fact is that this was, this was what was available for him to do. And certainly for me, because of my sort of turn of mind, it's easy to spend an awful lot of energy wishing the situation is, was other than what it was. And in fact, we have a finite range of options available to us to manifest resistance to the way things are. And none of them are perfect and none of them are cost free. And there has to be, and I, I suppose I'm addressing mainly myself here, but maybe also speaking to the sense of trouble that you described. We have to make peace with that on some level or we can't act at all. And I notice in myself, I would be the person who didn't act because I didn't want to get compromised by the messiness. Because there would be no perfect way of acting. There is no perfect way of acting that doesn't involve some costs and doesn't come along with some risks. And I notice that I moved to that place inside myself. I think, well, if I do that, then there'll be these bad consequences and that's not very good. So, and all of that results in doing nothing. And that's always the case. There are never perfect circumstances for action. We have to act anyway. So I think, but what Bonhoeffer teaches me is that that is painful and costly and we will be troubled. And it's proper that we're troubled because the costs are real. But the fact that we didn't have an alternative um, the fact is that we didn't have an alternative. And I do think that we're in that situation now. Do you want to say something? Mm, yeah, go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, <clears throat> I, I think one of, the re one of the reasons why what we're doing tonight is so important is we're trying to find the roots of what Commode is trying to communicate is the roots of the stories that are going to create a new motivation structure which is going to give us the fearlessness and power to do what we have to do and and I think that's what's been missing to a certain extent is is, an, is interrogating what those deeper stories are that's going to give us that strength and clarity. Because so much of what we do is, is these conundrums around surface issues, like why, sh why should I claim you know, not, not to be not guilty? Why should I disrupt the public? They're all surface questions. What, what we really need to be asking to give ourselves the strength and courage is what, what are the deep questions about who am I what is it to exist? What does it mean to be in community? What is the nature of the good, right? And as Kamadi said, all those questions have been sidelined in this fucked culture, right? 
and it's not like I'm obsessed with those questions, but the idea that those questions are not being asked is a massive reason for our disempowerment and our inability to succeed. I believe that extremely deeply because I see the people who are most powerful in this movement are clear about those questions. And we need to create the stories that, that give us the, question, the answers that empower us. So a story is last the following, right? I'll give you a story. Here's a story. The story is we are not individuals. We are a series of relationships in an objective community called humanity. The community comes first. The individual is the construction. Right? That's an ancient and noble idea in our culture, but it's totally lost. Now, once you see yourself as a community, it becomes entirely justified to disrupt other members of that community. Because you're not acting as an individual against another individual's self-interest. Everyone is in the same boat. If others participate in evil, they have to be stopped because they are part of you and you are part of them. And that's an actual objectivity. It's not a point of view, it's not a belief. So when you go into the road and people shout at you, that is the community speaking to itself. That's the community re-engaging with the perennial morality that we do not kill. Right? Which is another ancient story. So the disruption is not, is, 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 it's not an issue of morality. It's not an issue of surface, my interest versus them interest, right? It's an, it's a, it's an out, it's a, it's a drama of love, right? Do you understand what I mean by that? It means when you love another, you disrupt the other because you engage with the other because the other is part of you and you're part of them. And you see this in families all the time because families can't get away from this, right? So once you see disruption as an act of love, an act of recreation, an act of reformation, an act of salvation for the community itself, then everything falls into place and you can celebrate that disruption, right? Now, I'm not totally buying that story, okay? What I'm here to say is that's a fantastic story, isn't it? It's a fantastically right, empowering story rather than this, you know, you're disrupting other people, getting their kids to school in the morning, it might be five minutes late, oh dear, 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 sort of stuff, right? We don't need to buy that shit. We're part of a community. You see, you see what I'm saying? So I'm not saying that's the last word in the matter, but I think that's the project that we have to engage in. And I know there's people in here this evening who have the power and the, and the gift and the passion to communicate that. And that's what we have to do, right? We have to find the courage not just to break the law, we have to find the courage to tell a transgressive story that people are going to think we're idiots. But we still have to say it because our stories are better than theirs <laughs> in many different ways, right? Aren't they? You know, I'm just an individual and everything's scary and I'm full of pain and I mustn't upset anyone else. What a fucked story is that, right? Decrepit story. Thatcherite bollock story, <laughs> isn't it? There's so many richer stories, and so let's, you know, let's start telling some exciting stories. <laughs>